next speaker hardly needs an introduction as he is a legend in the CCHS community. He has been at the forefront of innovation in diagnosing and treating CCHS for nearly five decades. He is among a handful of experts in the world truly experienced in diagnosing and treating children with CCHS. He was my daughter's CCHS specialist and it has been my privilege to um, know him these past 30 plus years. Of course, I am talking about Dr. Thomas Keynes. Dr. Keynes is a pediatric pulmonologist at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and a professor of pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Dr. Keynes received his medical degree from the University of California, San Diego, completed a residency at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and a fellowship in pediatric pulmonology at Hospital for Sick Children, Toronto. Dr. Keynes has authored or co-authored well over 50 articles about CCHS. Dr. Keynes' research efforts are in the area of cystic fibrosis, SIDS, CCHS, pediatric respiratory physiology, and home mechanical ventilation. Dr. Keynes is board certified in pediatrics, neonatal perinatal medicine, and pediatric phonology. He is a member of the American Physiology Society. Society for Pediatric Research, the American Pediatric Society, the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Thoracic Society, the American College of Chest Physicians, Sleep Research Society, and the International Society for the Study and Prevention of Infant Deaths. In 2019, Dr. Keynes was awarded by the Pediatric Scientific Assembly of the American Thoracic Society, the most prestigious Pediatric Founders Award for his seminal contributions to the science and practice of pediatric respiratory medicine. Dr. Keynes is going to talk about the basics of respiratory physiology and mechanical ventilation in CCHLs. Welcome Dr. Keynes and thank you for your many years of service and dedication to CCHS. My name is Tom Keynes and um, welcome to the CCHS Family Conference. Um, I'm going to be speaking about Breathing 101. I'm um, from Children's Hospital Los Angeles and a professor of pediatrics, physiology, and neuroscience at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. So I don't have to tell people in this audience, don't take breathing uh, for granted. Um, breathing is, is important, and we're going to talk about breathing in people who don't have CCHS and what the problems are in CCHS. So the way that we kind of view somebody who can't breathe, okay, is that there's a balance, all right? So there's what we call a respiratory load. The respiratory load is how stiff your lungs are, if you have airway resistance or something. Some people need more effort to breathe. And on the other side of this balance is balance muscle power, that is the strength and endurance of your diaphragm and breathing muscles, and what we call central drive, which is your brain telling you how deep and frequently to breathe. Now, basically, ventilatory muscle power and central drive need to be more than adequate to overcome the respiratory load. So normal individuals without CCHS, their balance looks like this. You could, for example, exercise and increase your respiratory load, that is increase your breathing, and you would have enough ventilatory muscle power and central drive to overcome that. If you have a significantly increased respiratory load, for example, severe pneumonia, or shock lung, or something like that, and or decreased ventilatory muscle power as in neuromuscular diseases, or decreased central drive as in CCHS, then the balance might be tipped this direction, which means that muscle power and central drive cannot overcome the respiratory load, and therefore you have inadequate ventilation or respiratory failure. Now, Children with CCHS don't usually have much in the way of lung disease. So their respiratory load is normal. They don't have muscle weakness. So their ventilatory muscle power is normal. But they do have a decrease in central drive. And therefore, their balance can also be pushed in this direction. That is inadequate ventilation or respiratory failure because they don't have adequate central drive. So what is central drive? Your brain tells you how deep to breathe and how often to breathe. 
Your brain can measure oxygen and CO2 in your blood and increase your breathing if oxygen goes down or CO2 increases. Ordinarily, your brain may need to increase breathing during stresses such as exercise or in diseases like pneumonia, which could cause low oxygen or high CO2. So basically, the way your brain controls breathing, this is a picture of the brain, there are two uh, systems, if you will, that control breathing. One, which is up here in the so-called motor cortex, is what's called the behavioral or automatic, um, uh, behavioral or voluntary system. So for example, presumably I could ask any of you to hold your breath or to take a deep breath, and you could do that. That's behavioral ventilatory control. On the other hand, you don't think about breathing all the time. So there is a so-called automatic or metabolic control of breathing. And this is anatomically housed in the brainstem area. Um, it also notice is uh, right near what's called the reticular formation, which controls whether you're awake or asleep. So it turns out that being awake or asleep has a profound effect on breathing, as many of you uh, who are family members or patients with CCHS um, well know. <coughs> so the voluntary system anatomically housed up the top of your head in the uh, cortex, responsible for voluntary breathing, speech, laughing, etc., not regulated by blood tests. Automatic control of breathing is anatomically housed in the brainstem. It's tightly regulated blood gases. Uh, that is, if your CO2 goes up just a little bit, you're going to increase breathing. And their input actually for many reflexes, but we're going to focus on chemo receptors. So just to make things simple with respect to uh, CCHS, voluntary behavioral control, as best we can tell, is normal in children with CCHS. It's the automatic control of breathing that's abnormal. So let's look at automatic control of breathing or control of breathing. So basically, your brain has two ways to sense respiratory gases. There are so-called central chemo receptors that sense increased CO2. There's peripheral chemo receptors which sense, sense decreased oxygen. These are actually located in two different places, so they are separate. They input into kind of an integrator, which is called the ventilatory controller, uh, and which is literally still at this point in time a black box. And then this processes this information and sends out messages to control how much you breathe. That's called minute ventilation. Um, and so this is basically the way that this works. All neurology really, or neuroscientists has a sensor, which in this case is chemoreceptors, an integrator, which in this case is the ventilatory controller, and a motor response, which in this case is breathing. So let's kind of separate these out. And let's talk about central chemoreceptors first. So, What's plotted here is what's called minute ventilation or the amount of air that you're breathing in and out through your nose and mouth per minute, okay? What's plotted here is PCO2, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. If we, for example, have somebody rebreathe out of a bag, CO2 will increase. And when CO2 increases in a normal individual, minute ventilation or breathing increases in a linear fashion like this. And you can see that's a pretty tight relationship. This is the normal situation. And in fact, central chemoreceptors are responsible for your breathing minute to minute. If PCO2 goes up just a little bit, okay, minute ventilation is, go is going to go up to compensate for that. <clears throat> so what about CCHS? Now, this is measured in a CCHS patient while she was awake, right? I emphasize, while she was awake, right? We all learned that most of the problems in CCHS occur during sleep, but that's not all the problems. And I think you can see here that as, C as PCO2 increases, minute ventilation or breathing has no relationship. This is a shotgun blast. There's no relationship between CO2 and breathing. This was actually the original paper that we did way back in the late 80s. Um, and you can see five patients here that CO2 and minute ventilation did not correlate at all. So therefore, these children do not respond to increase CO2 as might occur in one disease. Well, let's look at peripheral chemoreceptors. This is oxygen. So in this case, peripheral chemoreceptors, if they're stimulated, are going to stimulate the ventilatory controller, increase minute ventilation or breathing. So this is the normal hypoxic ventilatory response. If we decrease oxygen in this direction, Minute ventilation increases, but it's 
not a linear fashion. It's in kind of a, a exponential sort of function here. Um, in fact, minute ventilation doesn't change much until you get down to a, P, a PO2 of 60, and then it increases pretty exponentially. Um, we can do this same thing looking at saturation, O2 saturation, as it's measured on a pulse oximeter, instead of PO2. And this, in fact, is a linear relationship. And you can see that as oxygen saturation falls, minute ventilation or the amount of breathing increases. So peripheral chemoreceptors are not responsible for breathing minutes a minute. They only stimulate breathing when you have significant low oxygen, that is when PO2 is less than 60. So they primarily provide a backup or safety system when central chemoreceptors fall. So what about CCHS patients? Again, the original five that we um, uh, reported, and these again were done during wakefulness, and you can see that there really is no relationship here between breathing and oxygen levels. In this case, oxygen going down. In some cases, for example, here, if you get more hypoxic, that is more low oxygen, you actually depress breathing. It's true here as well. Okay, so this is not the normal situation. Consequently, CCH test patients do not respond to low oxygen or high CO2. All right. So just to emphasize that point, people with CCHS do not recognize or respond to low oxygen or high CO2. Therefore, they will not rescue themselves from low oxygen conditions like pneumonia, for example. And further, they don't show outward signs that they're in trouble. For example, um, they, don't, they can be hypoxic, they can have low oxygen, but they don't sense it, so they don't show it. They don't increase their breathing. They don't have increased work of breathing. And so you may not be able to tell, looking at them, that they have low oxygen or high CO2, all right? This is an important point which we'll return to. But if they don't respond to oxygen and CO2, how do they breathe, okay? That's been kind of an interesting question. So one observation is that CCHS patients seem, as a group, to be able to exercise reasonably normally. And here are a number of our CCHS patients, in fact, exercising, okay? Um, so if they don't respond to oxygen and CO2, which are thought to be important in, in breathing during exercise, um, you know, why don't they run halfway across the playground, you know, turn blue and, and, and drop? Well, they don't do that. Again, those of you who are CCHS family members or people with CCHS know that you can often do a fair amount of exercise without having this problem. So breathing during exercise is controlled by chemoreceptors. CCHS patients without low oxygen or high CO2 responses seem to exercise okay. So how do they breathe, All right? So we actually looked at this as well a number of years ago. And we took a number of controlled children in this case who did not have CCHS and compared them to some children who did have CCHS. And this is kind of a composite graph, and I don't want you to worry about the details, but I'll kind of explain um, some of the things here. So plotted here is a minute ventilation amount of breathing, and plotted here is as you exercise an increase in metabolic rate. So when you increase metabolic rate during exercise, when you exercise harder, you basically use more oxygen and you produce more CO2. So this relationship should be linear, all right? So the controls non-CCHS are shown in the red here. And you can see that there is, in fact, a linear relationship here. What was very interesting is that CCHS, shown in the yellow-orange, also increased ventilation, but not quite as much as normal individuals. Okay, but that's important. They do, in fact, increase ventilation in response exercise. So how do they do that? I will spare you the long agony of us trying to figure this out. We eventually came on the thought that maybe they increased their ventilation in response to body motion. That is, if they were running, if they were running faster, that they would breathe faster. So to test this, we actually took a couple of CCHS patients <clears throat> and we put them on a treadmill. And we put them on a treadmill in two conditions. One was that the treadmill was at a very steep slope. So therefore they were running slowly. The other one, it was flat and they were running fast. Now we were able to match their metabolic rate. And you can see in the two conditions here, their metabolic rate was the same. 
obviously by design in the slow steep condition, they ran slower, okay, and ran faster in this condition. And the respiratory rate tracked that. In the slow condition, the respiratory rate was slower than in the fast condition where it was higher. The size of each breath, the tidal volume was the same in both conditions, and we know this about CCHS. And so the total amount of breathing or minute ventilation was higher when they're running fast than when they're running slow. So this suggested to us that body motion may in fact be a stimulus for breathing. So we did one other kind of fun study to test this, and that is we got a motorized bicycle, okay? And we had some CCHS patients put their feet on the bicycle. We had the motor turn the bicycle backwards so patients wouldn't inadvertently pedal with the bike. So this is passive motion of their legs, okay? And here's one of our subjects you can see um, on the bike. We're measuring her ventilation um, and a few things in this. The interesting thing was that as we increased RPMs, okay, revolutions per minute, how fast the bicycle was going, respiratory rate increased actually in CCHS and in controls, interesting. So the faster their legs were being moved over about 30 breaths a minute, 30 times a minute, their um, respiratory rate increased. Consequently, their ventilation or the amount of breathing increased. And you can see that here, again, in both controls and in CCHS patients, fascinating, all right? But gas exchange was affected only in CCHS. So here's the controls, and you can see that their CO2 didn't change, but the CCHS patients, which started with a higher CO2, dropped when they were having their legs passively moved. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so in CCHS, during exercise, PO2 and PCO2 were not precisely controlled, but actually they were not severely abnormal. I didn't show you this information, but their saturations dropped about five, not earth shattering, their CO2 went up about 10. Again, not life-threatening changes, but most important, their ventilation did increase and body motion appeared to be the mechanism that increased. Now, how does this differ from people without CCHS? So we believe that what happens that they also have this body movement stimulus and that gets them in a ventilation in the ballpark. And then chemoreceptors or chemoreceptor function, which they have, fine tunes the ventilation so that you have precise control of oxygen and CO2. So the point is that CCHS patients do have some mechanisms that control breathing that seem to be normal, okay? So CCHS patients without chemoreceptor function have fair gas exchange in, in exercise. And it's mechanoreceptors which seem to get the, the minute ventilation in the ballpark. That is, mechanoreceptors are sensing body movement and stimulating them to breathe. Chemoreceptors which fine tune um, PO2 and PCO2 are absent. Um, but the important point here is that we want and need redundancy of crucial physiologic control systems in order to establish optimal function. I'm just gonna digress a second. Some of you uh, may remember or be aware of, in May of 1979, a DC-10 commercial airliner crashed after taking off from Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Basically what they found was that a engine became detached and it severed the hydraulics which controlled the rudder. There was no redundancy in the airplane to control the rudder. So once that was severed, the pilot had no control over the airplane and the plane crashed, 271 people died. In the same way, breathing is too important to have only one control system. So we know that we have central chemoreceptors we talked about, peripheral chemoreceptors. There are also lung receptors, chest wall receptors. They're cortical influences on breathing. If somebody um, has a fever or is anxious or so on, that will actually increase um, breathing. And CCHS patients appear to have that intact. And body movement, uh, which they also appear to have intact. So basically, some of these work in CCHS and some of these do not. All right? So when is breathing worse in CCHS? Based on what we just said, what would you predict? Uh, a patient watching TV, reading a book, sitting quietly, 
or somebody who's active playing soccer or uh, doing some other physical activity. Well, based on what we just said, I think you could imagine that CCHS patients who are active are breathing better than CCHS patients who are um, still. Um, let me tell you kind of a cute anecdote of one of my patients from several years ago. So she had CCHS, she was in second grade. She didn't have a tracheostomy, but aside from that, her parents did not tell the school much about CCHS. They just said, you can't have her take a nap during school because I guess in second grade, they didn't do that anymore. So this second grade teacher, I thought was very astute. She noticed that when she had a class assignment where they were sitting for like half an hour or so doing reading or math or something like that, that my patient started to turn a little bit pale. And she thought, oh my gosh, she said, maybe I'd ever stand it up every five or 10 minutes and take some deep breaths. But she said, I don't want to single her out. So I'm going to have the whole class every five or 10 minutes stand up and take some breaths. And she said, you know, the whole class actually did better in terms of their uh, um, school function. But the key is that CHS patients do reasonably well during exercise. It's when they're still that there's potentially a problem. And I know some of you may have observed in your children with CCHS or those of you who have CCHS, that it's when you're still, when you're on the computer, when you're watching television, that you might underground light a little bit. Some children, we're gonna to get to this, some children may need to be on a ventilator during those times in addition to just being still. So the clinical problem in CCHS then is that it has absent subjective or object and objective, I should say, responses to low oxygen and high CO2, okay? Now, this usually manifests. So an individual without CCHS, okay, they have low oxygen. This usually manifests, they're distressed, they're anxious, they breathe fast, tachypnea, they have retractions, indrawing, nasal flaring. All of these things happen when somebody has low oxygen. But these signs are absent in CCHS. And the reason is that these signs require intact ventilatory control. It requires the patient or the child to be able to sense low oxygen and respond to it. Therefore, profound hypoxia can be present before CCHS show patients show clinical signs. And this, I, I would submit, is probably the biggest clinical problem dealing with CCHS. I frankly, I have trouble um, uh, educating my co-physicians here at Children's Hospital Los Angeles that this is important. Um, I can tell them this, and I turn around five minutes later, they have a kid, for example, who's just come out of anesthesia off the ventilator, and they say, well, he looks fine. Well, that's the point. They're always going to look fine. So this is what people need to be aware of. So the problem with CCHS is that they don't, or they don't breathe adequately. So what's the treatment? The treatment is to breathe for them. This is not rocket science, okay? They don't breathe, so you need to breathe for them. But it's not quite that simple. Let's look at when CCHS patients don't breathe. All right, this is a 13-year-old girl, 13-day-old girl, excuse me, <clears throat> with CCHS who uh, we treated a number of years ago. And um, what we're plotting here is CO2, okay? And you can see it's over the course of several hours, all right? So um, we use have a medical student um, kind of do this if they're on the service, you know, um, somebody's got to do it. So. Uh, we have them sit at the bedside and every five minutes record their CO2, their oxygen, their weight to sleep, heart rate, rest, heart rate. And this was the plot of this one patient. So you can see CO2 was normal at 40 when, when she was awake. She went to sleep and over the course of about, let's say, not quite an hour, CO2 rose to above 60. The only change was she woke up and her PCO2 came back down to normal. Then she went to sleep again and you can see CO2 went up to 75 or so. All right. Now, before we knew about the gene, all right, which was in 2003, this was the test we used to do to see if somebody had CHS. Okay. So we had a medical student on our service, and we had a patient that we thought probably had CHS, and ultimately we know does. Um, and so um, um, basically, we um, you know, have the student go down. And I said, now don't wimp out. Don't just stop if the PCO2 gets a 50 or 60. 
you know, this is a diagnosis that's going to affect this person for life. We want to make sure the kid has it. Okay. So I'm sorry, this should read one month old boy with CCHS. I apologize. So anyway, um, again, normal CO2 when the kid was awake. Kid went to sleep. She called me here. She said the PCO2 is 105. Is that high enough? I said, I'll be right down. It got up to 110 before I got down. And then all we did was wake him up. Okay. And see that his CO2 became normal. This really is a very unusual pattern. There are almost no diseases that do this, that uh, cause such high CO2 or under breathing. Remember, high CO2 means under breathing um, during sleep and different during wakefulness. Now, I will say that not every child has this uh, dramatic response this young. Many kids will hypoventilate awake or asleep and gradually mature to this pattern if they're going to. Now, this doesn't go away. This is a, um, in this case, about a three and a half year old boy with CCHS. And you can see that we kind of monitored over the course of the day, um, his CO2 in red and his oxygen. And even when he's awake, you can see that there's considerable variation in oxygen and CO2. These kids are not breathing normally, even when they're awake. During the sleep, of course, CO2 went higher and oxygen went lower. So it was once thought that CCHS patients were either full-time ventilator dependent or dependent only during sleep. But we now know that there is a continuum. Some patients need more ventilatory support than sleep only, but not quite full-time. So I have a number of patients, for example, that do best if they're ventilated, for example, 16 hours a day or maybe 20 hours a day. Um, not quite full-time, but more than during sleep. And this is determined by testing. That's the only way that one can sort this out. <clears throat> so, come on, do CCHS patients really need to be ventilated or is oxygen enough? I mean, can we just give, this, give these kids oxygen and get rid of all this equipment? So one of the dreaded complications of CCHS is pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension occurs when there's low oxygen, okay, and low oxygen causes pulmonary blood vessels, that is blood vessels in the lung to constrict. And if that constricts, it means that the resistance is higher, the tubes are smaller, so the heart has to pump harder to get blood through small tubes, okay? If this is persistent and high enough, it can cause the heart to fail and patients can actually die from this. So we know that oxygen is an important controller of pulmonary vascular resistance, and as with the previous things, pulmonary vascular resistance seems to be more or less normal until a PCO2 of 60. And then below that, it rises uh, pretty substantially exponentially. So if somebody is unbreathing chronically, let's say in this area or this area, they can develop pulmonary hypertension. And we've had a number of infants or children who came back to us presenting with pulmonary hypertension. They were missed in the newborn nursery. We don't do blood gases on normal babies. They look fine, and remember now you know why, but they came back after experiencing low oxygen for quite a period of time and developing pulmonary hypertension. Now, this is reversible, okay? So when we ventilate them adequately, this all goes away. All right, so the question is, do they really need to be ventilated? Um, we had actually our first CCHS patient who at around age uh, three or so, um, was causing quite a bit of, of difficulty for his mom. Um, he would uh, pull the, vent the ventilator off his tray. Um, if she waited for him to go to sleep and tried to put it back on or wake him up, um, you know, this in some respect might sound a little humorous, but this is a serious problem. So I was open minded at that point in time. I said, well, do the kids really need to be ventilated? So we put in what's called the swan, which measured the pulmonary artery pressure. Okay, and we had the child spontaneously breathing asleep, room air, 100% oxygen. Okay, obviously the PO2, the oxygen level went up, breathing 100% oxygen. Um, note that the CO2 actually goes up. Normal individuals will do this, and this is intact in CCHS. So this is one of the other mechanisms that's actually intact. But pulmonary artery pressure was high, normal is 15, okay, and it remained high even on 100% oxygen. So 100% oxygen did not solve our problem, okay? Then we put the kid on a ventilator, ventilated him down to a low PCO2, 
around 30. Okay. And uh, whether he was on room air or 100% oxygen, obviously the oxygen chain, his pulmonary artery pressure was low and remained low. So the answer is these kids need to be ventilated. Supplemental oxygen alone is not enough. All right. When they're hypoventilated, um, how much do they need, need to be ventilated at home? Should their PC2 be less than 40? Should it be 40, which would be a normal value, or should it be greater than 40? So um, we did a study, but David Grizzall was a fellow here, um, where we looked at some of our CCHS kids who were in the hospital for a variety of reasons, but, but healthy, okay? And we randomized them to be ventilated to an end tidal CO2 of 45 on the ventilator at night, okay? Or 45 or greater, or a CO2 of less than 35. And then we measured their CO2 during spontaneous breathing during the daytime when they were awake. And we did it one hour after coming off the ventilator about middle of the day and right before going on the ventilator in the evening. And what you can see is if they were ventilated to what some ICUs might do, PCO2 of 45 or greater, their PCO2 during spontaneous breathing was around 50. If they were hyperventilated, if you will, to PCO2 is less than 35, they were able to maintain better or more normal PCO2s at 40 or less, All right? So therefore, we recommend and feel strongly that these patients should be ventilated to a CO2 of 35 or less. Ideally 35 to 40, uh, I'm sorry, 30 to 35, but even 25 to 35, Overventilating does not seem to be harmful. If you do this, they're less likely to fight the ventilator. Of course, CCHS patients don't use effective ventilator. It provides reserve for changes in pulmonary mechanics or acute respiratory infection. So if a child gets a cold or bronchitis at home, you've got a little bit of reserve there. You don't necessarily need to bring your kid to the hospital. It decreases pulmonary hypertension, which I showed you um, just a minute ago. There's better spontaneous ventilation during the wait. And our really long clinical experiences that they do much, much, much better if they are hyperventilated during sleep than if they're ventilated during um, standard ways. Now, remember the respiratory balance here. And the problem with CCHS is that central drive is decreased. So it doesn't overcome the respiratory load and we have respiratory effect. However, because CCHS patients do not usually have lung disease, there's a wide variety of ventilatory techniques available to them. They can be ventilated by a traditional trach vent. They can be ventilated by non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or BiPAP. They can be ventilated by diaphragm pacing. They can be ventilated by negative pressure ventilation. We don't do that too much anymore because it's not quite so portable, but it works, okay? Um, others in this conference, I think, are going to talk about these other techniques, so I'm not going to sort them out, the important thing is that these kids do need to be ventilated. Once they're, let's say, age five or six, how that is done um, really becomes a matter of lifestyle and, and family choice and is not so important so long as it is effective. So in summary, adequate ventilation requires intact central respiratory drive. That's what's missing. Central drive is missing in CCHS patients. They do not respond to low oxygen or high CO2. So therefore, they can get into trouble. Um, when they experience pneumonia, for example, they will not increase their ventilation the way an otherwise normal individual would. We need to support their ventilation when they hypoventilate. But there's a range of how much ventilatory support is required. Some children require ventilatory support only during sleep. Some children require full-time but increasingly we're finding that there are a number of patients that require a little bit more than sleep only, but maybe not full-time ventilatory support. So like I said, I have some patients who require 14 hours, 16 hours or 20 hours of ventilatory support per day to maintain adequate function, not quite full-time, but more than sleep. Hyperventilation during ventilatory support is associated with a better clinical outcome. So, I want to thank you all for inviting me to participate in this conference. I've enjoyed it very much, and I hope that this has been helpful. Thank you so much.